India's nuclear developments has several shades of gray, uh, if you talk about, uh, and once I talk about shades of gray, I'm also talking about their uh, civil military nuclear program uh, developments, the doctrinal evolution, or its approach towards arms control. And uh, because of these ambiguities, there is always risk of instability in South Asia. And that is the primary reason that there's a need to discuss these issues more and more. There are several factors that continue to overshadow India's nuclear developments. I'll just list them. First is discord amongst India's political, military, and military leadership, and also the scientific establishment. Probably there is no coherence on the purpose of why India should have nuclear deterrence or capability. So that signal, the confusing signal coming out from different uh, leadership of the military and civilian, and that causes uh, ambiguity about uh, the purpose of having that nuclear capability. The second is about inconsistency in India's threat perception. Is it China or Pakistan? Because we all know India's military is mostly poised, the nuclear and conventional is poised towards Pakistan. But lately, India has continued to uh, promote this narrative that China is the primary adversary and not Pakistan. The third is the doctrinal contradictions. The declaratory policy that India has is not in sync with its nuclear development. So I'll cover four major areas, that is nuclear developments, and the uh, shades of gray in India's nuclear doctrine, uh, some of the other developments like the development of hypersonic weapons or BMT system and its impact on strategic stability. I'll just briefly highlight those and India's approach towards arms control. So if you talk about nuclear development, why did India develop nuclear weapons? Because publicly, Indian leadership continues to oppose nuclear development or nuclear weapons, and they uh, promote nuclear disarmament or global disarmament. That has been a position, consistent position taken from early 50s till late. But simultaneously, India continues to build its nuclear capability, both in terms of numbers and quality both. Um, then if you talk about specifically about, um, I'm sure Dr. Rabia will talk more about these issues, especially the NFU, but I'll just um, uh, pick some of those issues. India follows a posture of credible minimum deterrence, but at the same time, it is building triad also in the process of operationalizing its triad. So having all land, air and sea based capabilities, and it's also multiplying its weapons or delivery systems and multiplying its missile stocks. So that is not in sync with what India wants the rest of the world to believe that it has a credible minimum deterrence. Interestingly, in uh, uh, 2017 joint military doctrine, this minimum was omitted, whether it was with a purpose or just a typo error as some of the Indian scholars or friends they suggested, but I think a document coming from senior leadership, military leadership, omitting the minimum and just talking about credible deterrence uh, must have some significance. And then they talk about credible minimum deterrence, but anything that would be credible against <clears throat> China in terms of numbers, it cannot be minimum against Pakistan. And anything would uh, minimum against Pakistan will not be credible against China. So that's a dichotomy in India's this credible minimum deterrence posture. The second shade of gray is about the no first use. You have talked uh, enough, uh, but I'll just uh, give my perspective on this. The draft nuclear doctrine of 1999, this gave unconditional no first use assurance. But the subsequent document of 2000, January 2003, it was conditional, uh, and which is uh, generally taken as India's official policy. And it stated that India reserves the right to respond with nuclear weapons if attacked by chemical or biological weapons. So it, in effect, nullifies India's uh, no first use commitment. But in my personal conversation, thanks to social media, um, a senior uh, three star general uh, from the Indian side, he said, that reserves the right doesn't mean that India will use or retaliate with nuclear weapons. So creating more ambiguity about that. General Nagal, uh, B.S. Nagal, former uh, commander of India's strategic forces, he talked about first use and said the strategy is and supporting systems that complement this policy must be implemented and made functional on the ground. So he was uh, a former commander of India's strategic force command. 
India's former national security advisor, uh, he said, uh, Shiv Shankar Menon in his book, Choices, wrote that in, under certain situations, India might find it useful to strike first, especially if there is a threat of use of nuclear weapons by the adversary. By retaliating even by against the threat of use of nuclear weapons, not actual use of nuclear weapons, and going for a preemptive strike, especially once India does not have um, credible information, intelligence, or surveillance and reconnaissance system to credibly verify whether Pakistan is going to launch or not, even against a threat uh, if uh, India is thinking about launching a first strike. So this brings into question about the no first use uh, posture. So the key takeaways from the no first use controversy, number one, India may have given up on its no first use commitment and could contemplate a comprehensive first strike against Pakistan while maintaining a public posture of no first use against China. And number two, um, India does not have, as I said, I2SR capabilities. Um, so the question of launching a preemptive first strike again uh, whether it's for political dividends or it is actual their operational doctrine. Uh, I believe that no first use statements are more intended to create uh, space for India's limited war fighting doctrine. By threatening a first strike, probably Indian decision makers might be hoping that they would be able to deter Pakistan from early deployment of its short range ballistic missiles, and hence they would have that space to launch conventional military operations against Pakistan. So that could be. Uh, one uh, possibility. Uh, finally, one uh, important thing in the context of no first use, because uh, the remarks that I heard from the senior uh, scholars uh, in UK in a recent uh, webinar, they often underplay remarks made by the Defense Minister Manohar Parekar and other people that they didn't mean about uh, giving up no first use. But on the other hand, any statement coming from the Pakistani side, they do overplay to draw their own peculiar, peculiar lessons. One example is the interview given by General Kidwai in 2002, somewhere to the Italian journalist, in which he alluded to the possibility of using nuclear weapons under certain conditions. But the, many of these scholars who want to draw their own lesson, they continue to harp on the same theme, that these are the four red lines that Pakistan has. Uh, so that is misleading, I would say. And after 20 years, I think uh, many things have changed. One has to uh, review that. Uh, other developments, I'll briefly, I have a stopwatch, Tell me for you. So I have on mobile my stopwatch. So I'll not go into detail, hypersonic weapons, BMD system, ASAT, and second strike capability. All these factor into Pakistan's security calculus and it affects it adversely uh, on uh, deterrent stability. Um, Again, on the arms control, if you see the approaches, India was in the front uh, negotiating CTBT, NPT, but once the drafts were concluded, India said the NPT is nuclear apartheid and they are never going to sign CTBT. And similar approach, uh, contrary to the general perception that uh, Pakistan continues to hold on the F FMCT. 2009, the debates are on record. India was the one which opposed the start of negotiations at conference on disarmament. And finally, uh, in terms of arms control, if you are talking about the nuclear ban treaty or the treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons, Again, India projects or uh, advocates complete nuclear disarmament, but this treaty was about banning nuclear weapons, so it opposed it didn't sign that. Um, going to the future, I'll skip the CBMs part uh, because uh, my time is already over. I have overshot the future. Uh, after this India-US nuclear cooperation, probably India's security orientation has changed or it wants to change that because it sees itself as a major player in a United States-led Indo-Pacific strategy. And it feels that it doesn't need to um, engage with its relatively smaller neighbors, especially Pakistan. So it has become more and more dismissive towards Pakistan. And uh, to conclude, um, since this narrative of non-state actors in South Asia, the threat of escalation to nuclear, I think I'll just uh, make a brief comment on this. This narrative is obsolete now, especially after seeing the behavior of India's uh, leadership, Prime Minister Modi, threatening nuclear retribution against Pakistan. So this narrative of non-state actors getting hold of nuclear weapons or triggering a nuclear crisis between India and Pakistan, why I mentioned this is, again, referring to some of the serious studies done by leading think tanks, 
Even now, they continue to harp on the same theme, although much has changed at the uh, state level, especially in India under BJP, which thinks that nuclear weapons are something that can be used between India and Pakistan. So I'll stop over here and thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a very comprehensive roundup, Dr. Abdul Sultan. Uh, before we have uh, Frank speaking on uh, this topic, uh, India's nuclear posturing during the Parvama and Ladakh crisis, uh, uh, I would like to acknowledge this piece that he wrote last year uh, for the nine dash line uh, uh, on uh, title as the Ladakh border crisis further uh, places further pressure on India's nuclear boundaries. And uh, I would also uh, like to bring it into uh, audiences notice that uh, even the title of this webinar is inspired from that piece because Frank wrote that uh, New Delhi strategic planners see a greater role for nuclear weapons in India's general defense, and that became the precursor that became the precursor for this uh, webinar started. So over to you, uh, Dr. Franco Don. Uh, I uh, I yield this time to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the Center for Strategic and Contemporary Research, Saman Rizwan, for organizing this panel, and to Anas Abdullah and Tala Ibrahim for their kind opening remarks, and to those in the audience who have tuned in. Uh, we've got a terrific panel here, and I think we should have some great conversations both now and in the Q&A. Uh, and so my topic is India's nuclear posturing during the Pulwama and Ladakh crisis, and I'll make three main points. Uh, the first is that India and Pakistan both evidenced during the Pulwama Balakot crisis an increasing willingness to employ nuclear signaling and even brinkmanship than in previous crises. Unfortunately, both sides seem to have learned lessons that this strategy worked for them, uh, which I think both probably for the next crisis. Uh, the second point is by distinct contrast and kind of contrary to perhaps my expectations when I wrote that piece that uh, Tal alluded to, India, so far as to my knowledge, adopted the opposite approach toward China in the Ladakh crisis and refraining from discussing nuclear weapons or contingencies at all. The last point I'll make is that this is, this is indicative that India does increasingly seem to think about the role of nuclear weapons in its defense differently when it comes to Pakistan and China. I'm not ready to say yet that India has two different nuclear strategies for each state, but there is growing ambiguity around how it sees nuclear weapons in its national defense. Firstly, on Palama Balakot, after the horrific terrorist attack on Indian paramilitary forces in Kashmir, India undertook multiple measures that amounted to nuclear signaling. The standard protocols developed by India's Nuclear Command Authority and the Military Strategic Forces Command mandate that nuclear weapons be moved out of storage and at least co-located with delivery vehicles in the early stages of a conventional crisis with Pakistan or China. And uh, during Pulama Balako, this included the Arihant, uh, India's nuclear armed submarine being deployed to sea. The Indian Navy was also directed to locate every single Pakistan Navy vessel in preparation for potential later order for the neutralization. This included some vessels which may be dual use, such as PNS SAD. The Indian Navy was directed to take all necessary actions to force submarines to surface, regardless of whether or not the submarine might be potentially nuclear armed. So we already have a lot of inadvertent escalation risk being built up in the initial Indian response before the airstrikes took place. The Indian airstrikes themselves were remarkable in that they closely resembled in several different respects what an Indian Air Force nuclear attack would look like. The planes of Mirage 2000s, which is a platform assessed by multiple sources to be one assigned Indian nuclear missions, they took off from Gwalior Air Force Base, one of the few bases that is again widely assessed to host planes assigned nuclear missions and even pot potentially have warheads stationed on the base. In a way, it's perhaps fortunate that the Indian feint of distracting the Pakistan Air Force and air defenses toward Bawalpur works, uh, because as for the above reasons, the Pakistan Air Force could very easily have interpreted the incoming planes on the Balakot mission as being a nuclear attack and things could have escalated quickly from there. After that, things got worse. Uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan convened not just the National Security Council, but then the National Command Authority, which of course is the, the distinct separate body for planning and executing nuclear operations. And the fact that the NCA meeting was heavily publicized can only be viewed as a nuclear signal. India, for its own part, then stationed at least 12 Prithvi missiles in Rajasthan, which are nuclear capable, 
threatened Pakistan with their use unless the captured Indian pilot was released, and then also made clear that the US was aware of all these developments. This is a level of brinkmanship we haven't seen in years. And while we were fortunate that the crisis ended without significant further casualties, there's a danger I feel that both India and Pakistan have learned that they can go up the escalation ladder, including nuclear brinkmanship as, as we have seen, and then essentially scare the US into brokering a de-escalation. And while I believe there's a large amount of luck on both sides that things did not get worse in terms of misinterpreting actions and signals, uh, at the same time, I expect India and Pakistan to still be thinking about how they can utilize these kinds of dangerous signaling and brinkmanship tactics in the next crisis. And the difference between that and the India-China Ladakh crisis is stark. Apart from a tactical move to capture high ground near the southern bank of Pangong So in August 2020, the Indian approach almost from the start has instead been to lower tensions and to prioritize diplomacy. There's been no Indian mention of nuclear weapons during this crisis, which is one of the worst India has suffered in its history. And I think this shows that there's this increasing divergence of how India thinks about nuclear weapons as national defense toward China on the one hand and on toward Pakistan on the other. We also have to add in the Rajnath Singh statement of August 2019 regarding India's no first use policy in which he referred to the policy only in the past tense and said what happens in the future depends on the circumstances. So there is a lot of monitoring with regard to India's nuclear policy, especially as it pertains to Pakistan and what India learned from the Balakot crisis. However, at the same time, Pakistan was not entirely blameless in the crisis there either. And I think the NCA meeting was a nuclear signal that generated more risk of misinterpretation than it was probably worth. Uh, and with that, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Frank. You, uh, you took two minutes to uh, use uh, you just used eight minutes of your time uh, to give your perspective on uh, the title that was uh, the topic that was assigned to you. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Tanvi Purkarni who will be speaking on uh, is India's nuclear strategy and doctrine uh, really changing? Thank you. Thank you, Tala. Um, and, um, uh, and, and thank you for um, your remarks, both Frank and uh, Dr. Sultan. So good evening, everyone, and thank you to CSCR for having me here. I have to say that um, I'm doing a webinar discussion on nuclear issues related to South Asia after what seems like a really long time. So it also goes on to show um, that at the moment, uh, this issue seems to be on the back burner. But um, in the context of what we are discussing today, that is the role of nuclear weapons in India's defense, I'm going to be talking about the Indian nuclear doctrine, and I'm specifically going to be arguing why I don't think that nuclear weapons have become more significant in India's overall defense thinking and strategy, again, keeping to the context of the nuclear doctrine. Now, for over two decades, India's nuclear doctrine has been vociferously discussed and debated within India. And one of the primary reasons for why this has been or why it's been possible to do that is because the government at that time decided to put it out for public scrutiny, allowing all kinds of critique and feedback. So to quickly go over then, after the nuclear tests of 1998, a committee of experts was formed by the Indian government under the newly established National Security Council called as the Drafting Committee. On 17 August, 1999, the draft report on Indian nuclear doctrine was finalized and presented by the National Security Council for a more public discussion. The paper declared at the outset that it's a document outlining the broad principles for the development, deployment and employment of India's nuclear forces and that it does not spell out India's nuclear strategy or policy thereof. Then three and a half years later, on 4th of January 2003, the Cabinet Committee on Security of the Government of India, after reviewing this draft report of the NSAB, formally adopted the Indian nuclear doctrine. Now the 1999 and 2003 versions put together at the declaratory level have three elements. First is that um, there's a political psychological conception of nuclear weapons. That is the belief that nuclear weapons are political instruments of deterrence rather than military tools of war fighting. A commitment to nuclear uh, disarmament, universal nuclear disarmament, and your unilateral moratorium on nuclear testing as well as imposing strict export controls on nuclear and missile related materials and technologies. 
At the operational level, uh, the doctrine guided nuclear policy by adhering to no first use against nuclear weapons possessors and non-use against non-nuclear weapon states, a credible minimum deterrence which was to be based on a nuclear triad, so with survivability and dispersal being its main features, strict civilian control over nuclear forces, a second strike capability and deterrence through punishment or retaliation. Massive retaliation, even if it is delayed, Countervalue plus targeting and a response to chemical and biological attacks on India. Now, cut to the present times. None of these elements have gone away or have been obviously altered in the Indian nuclear doctrine today. Of course, the doctrine is not of a permanent, unchanging nature, and it is subject to periodic reviews. And in that spirit, the doctrine's features and elements have been debated domestically and internationally. But most importantly, in the last two decades, India's security environment has changed drastically. It's become more complex and even more curial. And India's own position within the region and amongst the international community has changed. And these changes and transformations have called for revisiting some of the elements of nuclear policy and strategy, particularly because of the emergent military technologies and rapidly changing composition of capabilities in the overall military balance within the region. But even then, successive governments in India have not really felt the need to officially change the broader elements of the nuclear doctrine. Now, what has happened in the post-2003 phase after the nuclear doctrine was um, adopted is two things happened simultaneously, which I think had a direct bearing on the Indian nuclear doctrine. First, in the phase from 2003 to about 2011-12, a lot of efforts were put in um, putting layers of fire breaks into India's nuclear posture. And this was sort of a continuation um, since the 1990s. Now, what do I mean by that? The Indian leadership very clearly and consistently has acknowledged that nuclear weapons are different. They are a separate category of weapons with far destructive power than conventional military weapons, and therefore they're to be treated differently, essentially as political tools of veterans. So a lot of effort was put on highlighting the nuances within the doctrine. If you want to call it ambiguities, you can call it that. I would like to call it nuances. So for instance, massive retaliation posture, which is basically a war termination posture, okay, has been tried to, has been tied to the second strike capability as well as to the NFG. Even as massive remains deliberately undefined, it does not automatically preclude a sense of calibration and proportionality vis-a-vis -vis the source, the nature, the scale of an incoming nuclear first attack. So you can think of it as somewhat like a nuance that is built into the Pakistani posture. Now the option for first use does not count as guarantee of first use. Again, massive is tied with unacceptable damage and the onus of calculating the unacceptable in the unacceptable, in the unacceptable damage is upon the adversary. Now the fact that the Indian nuclear doctrine does not identify one particular adversary means that these calculations for unacceptable can be varied. Especially the 1999 and the 2003 documents put together, the idea of proportionality is not completely missing because there are distinctions put in place between responding to countervalue attacks on the homeland and responding to counterforce attacks in a foreign territory. Minimalism has been built into the NFU uh, in terms of the eventuality of use and into the command and control structure in terms of the cost size eventuality uh, of the use of nuclear weapons. But yes, a lot of these, what I would say, tacit fire breaks are understood mostly through statements and interpretations by officials. The more explicit fire breaks come from the series of confidence building measures, unilateral as well as bilateral, that have been agreed to and adhered to. Now, these include crisis communication mechanisms, crisis avoidance measures, etc. On the other hand, since 2003, what has also happened is India has continued to create nuclear capacities, assets and structures to build its credible second strike capability. Over the last two decades, many of these assets and systems have improved in terms of accuracy, survivability, range, etc. And some of them continue to be refined. And yet, India's nuclear arsenal today is relatively small at about 150 warheads and about 60 missiles. 
In 2021, India has definitely grown a lot more confident as compared to the India of 2001 to leverage its nuclear capability for, for signaling deterrence. It's been able to leverage a good non-proliferation record, crisis behavior record, to scope favorably both domestically as well as internationally. And these are considered as diplomatic successes. So on one hand, India's nuclear capabilities are growing. On the other hand, the doctrinal firebreaks and the CBM firebreaks still remain intact. So I know, uh, of course, there's a lot of debate, especially on the sustainability of the Indian NFU posture. And frankly, as, um, as one of the earlier speakers mentioned, that this debate has been going on for many years now. But this debate has also gone on to show that with the geopolitical relocation of nuclear politics to the Asia Pacific, the firebreaks are increasingly coming under pressure from external security threats on one hand and from the changing military balance of power in the region on the other hand. However, despite past indications of reviewing the NFU policy, recent statements have also come from officials that indicate that there is still a conscious choice being made to retain the NFU. And these statements and assertions include you know, those made by the Minister of State for External Affairs in March 2020, the Indian Ambassador to the CD in October 2020, by the Foreign Secretary in October 2020, and in February 2021. Now, generally, what would be the indications of nuclear weapons taking greater prominence in the overall defense strategy of a country. There would be greater visibility of these weapons in the country's military plans. There would be greater budget allocations to nuclear weapons modernization. Um, there'll be substantial increase in stockpiles and aimed at attaining a first strike capability. There could be a lowering of threshold either by announcing it or developing capabilities, especially towards it. There could be a pattern of show of nuclear force through signaling threats and military exercises. Um, they could be putting most of your strategic weapons on high state of readiness, decentralization of nuclear decision making to the military levels, uh, there could be withdrawal from confidence building agreements and international treaties, or there could be diplomatic objectives that can only be achieved through recourse to nuclear weapons, like extended deterrence. Now, none of these can be seen in the case of India. India's present and envisaged nuclear military capabilities in India indicate that it's still vying for a credible and survivable second strike capability. The Indian nuclear doctrine, in fact, enjoys wide political um, support um, and calls for review and clarifications should be seen as part of this political consensus. As I mentioned earlier, the kinds of linkages that are built into the Indian nuclear doctrine make it very difficult to change just one element without dismantling the other elements. And given that the doctrine is very central to India's identity as a responsible nuclear power, the chances of a complete dismantlement of the doctrine are really very low. Nuclear weapons as of now do not figure in India's military plans while dealing with border conflicts with either Pakistan or China. And now given the Indian political and military leadership as well as scholars and analysts in, this, um, in, in the country are talking more conclusively about the possibilities of a two front confrontation on the Northern borders it really remains to be seen how nuclear weapons will figure in this calculus or be built into contingencies. But India's military modernization has domestically been critiqued as being slow paced and inadequately funded. The capital budget in fact allocated in 2020-21 for modernization was 35% less than what the armed forces had asked for it. Um, the budget for military spending in 2020-21 was merely 6% more than what it was the previous year. And, these, and this is not really enough to make big strides for nuclear modernization. India has not gone down the route of battlefield nuclear weapons, or as you'd like to call it, tactical nuclear weapons. The sea-based deterrence is currently premature, and the continuous at-sea deterrence posture is still aspirational. Um, the Indian Navy has only one SSBM, current, SSBM currently. So the kind of military modernization that has taken place in India goes on to show that it is the non-nuclear capabilities that still remain at the core of defense planning, uh, preparation and thinking in the country. And finally, um, sorry, I, I think I've taken two minutes of Frank. Um, so just to wrap it up um, and to connect it to the next part, I'm looking forward to what um, remarks Shafia is gonna make. Yes, there are nuclear dangers um, in South Asia. For most part, the risks are associated with misperceptions and miscalculations about each other's doctrines, capabilities and signaling. The risks are associated with both low yield battlefield nuclear weapons as well as dual use capabilities during crisis time. 
These risks are associated with poor crisis communication practices and almost non-existent crisis de-escalation mechanisms. Um, the risks also emanate from the dynamics of strategic rivalries in the region that now include the first nuclear weapons powers, their military technological arms racing, asymmetrical capabilities, asymmetric capabilities, etc. And in this strategic chain, or linkage as some would like to call it, major technological and doctrinal shifts by even one player can manage to have a range of consequences, right from a trickle down arms race effect to even produce significant structural changes in the nuclear order. I'll stop it at that. Thank you for my time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tanvi, for your remarks. Uh, before I cede talking space to Dr. Abhi Akhtar, I would like to request the audience that is viewing the webinar uh, proceedings to put their question in the chat box. If you are viewing it through our YouTube channel, you can put the questions uh, in the YouTube chat box. If you are viewing it through Zoom, uh, uh, put the questions here. Please in keep your questions brief and introduce yourself too. I'll take your questions one by one. Uh, once uh, uh, we'll have, we'll, uh, once Dr. Rabi Akhtar will finish, and uh, that's how we'll proceed. Uh, over to you, Dr. Rabi Akhtar. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much, Anas and Tala, for having me here. Um, I could simply say that I would like to refer to the first three speakers for their eloquent speeches on NFU or touching parts of it, and I would be done. Uh, but I I guess I won't be off the hook. So I'll just make uh, some brief remarks. I'll try not to be repetitive and be provocative. Uh, if you have been following the debate on the Indian NFU, you would know that uh, several current and retired Indian officials have made some statements to the effect of ditching the NFU. I would urge everybody to read uh, Dr. Rajesh Rajagopalan's Carnegie essay to understand the divide between the Indian scholarly strategic community as to how divided they are on whether India is going to keep the NFU or move to us, the first Jews. For Pakistan, it is important to survey these Indian statements for two reasons. One, for the sacrosanctity of India's NFU being diluted by the Indian leadership. Uh, two, the principal issue with NFU amply highlighted by India's political, military, and strategic elite of it being Pakistan specific. Uh, they argue that NFU does not deter Pakistan from whipping up its subconventional war against India. These two factors, when they're taken together, are instrumental to any discussion on the Indian NFU. Pakistan's disbelief in India's NFU coupled with virtual denunciation of the NFU in, in the official doctrine of 2003, represented by the announcement that India will reserve the right to use nuclear weapons in response to biological chemical weapons attack was an irritant already. Now, the constant eviscerations of the NFU in order to deal with the so-called Pakistan's terrorism conundrum is but a step towards bringing about a shift in how India perceives nuclear weapons. Is India bringing its nuclear threshold down to trying to deter subconventional war through nuclear weapons? It may perhaps seem so at first glance. Whether India formally renounces NFU or not uh, becomes immaterial for Pakistan. At a time when India is openly stating the intent of capturing territory from Pakistan by use of force, Pakistan cannot help but take this constant dilution seriously. Will Pakistan review its readiness levels and even thresholds? I believe it has to. A purported shift from NFU to FU on part of India has to be put into perspective. That India wants to shift its policy to overcome a strategic paralysis at the tactical level is instructive to say the least. This is primarily because India is signaling this. To shape outcomes on the battlefield in its favor, it must retain the option of using nuclear weapons first. And this brings two uh, concomitant problems. One, if the logic of nuclear strategy is anything to go by, India can ill afford to carry out a counter value strike while leaving Pakistan with all its retaliatory capacity to strike back. Therefore, India's first use could only be effective if that country launches counter, launches counter force strikes. Second, the nuclear threshold could come down precipitously. Taken together, both these effects will engender pressure on Pakistan to draw first blood and in the process dilute crisis and deterrent stability. I'm sure all of you have read the 2019 uh, Christopher Clary and Vipin Narang's article and in which they have argued based on official criticism of the NFU, coupled with this inability to fund Pakistan, India is gearing its nuclear de developments towards adding counter force options in its capability 
spectrum so as to effectively deal with its perennial Pakistan conundrum. However, both rightly outlined that India's drive to obliterate Pakistan's strategic forces is rife at great risks due to a variety of reasons. They contend that India's counterforce doctrine could bring in first strike instability, since Pakistan would not wait for India to go first and disarm it. Indeed, as the authors say, a belief that one side could strike first could incentivize the other side to use it or lose it. For Pakistan, I believe a rethink is a must. Both deterrent stability and crisis stability will come under severe stress, whether India formally declares a first use policy or chooses to consistently discredit its contestable NFU. Now, with regard to crisis stability, Pakistan must look at India as now being in the future scenario. It continues to press ahead with its cold start doctrine, teasing out the challenges of early mobilization. It believes that its adversary, which is Pakistan, is capricious enough to draw first blood against it. Therefore, the Indian leadership decides to preempt and mull over launching weapons first, the Indian logic of preemption. Now, conversely, fearing a preemptive first strike, Pakistan might entertain ideas of using them rather than losing them. Now, the incentive to go first, regardless of whether it is through a counter force or a counter value strike, is inherently an anathema to deterrence and crisis stability. Pakistan, due to its size and lack of depth, can ill afford to absorb a nuclear strike from India. Even India, or any state for that matter, cannot let another state cause obliteration to their homeland. India, therefore, in its thinking towards developing a preemption doctrine, is not prepared to stop uh, or absorb Pakistan's uh, first strike at any cost. It's just uh, you know, illogical that India would be willing to absorb uh, a first strike from Pakistan. As far as general deterrence and deterrence stability are concerned, the changing role of nuclear weapons, as presented by India's flirtations with NFU and strikes towards counter force options, will be termed as an attempt to escape from the hallmarks of the nuclear revolution theory. Deterrence stability will then be challenged by efforts to deride mutual vulnerabilities, change patterns of deployments, and a fable to recess deterrence. Now, an India which is laced with counterforce options and free from the constrictions of NFU will indeed be a bane for deterrence stability. That said, the ambiguity surrounding India's current doctrinal thought are, are enough to put exceeding pressures on deterrence stability, especially for Pakistan. So as I see it, the first and foremost objective of Pakistan's nuclear forces should be to eliminate any Indian temptations to launch a preemptive nuclear first strike against Pakistan, period. The idea is for general deterrence to hold. But if India possesses first strike capability against Pakistan with, without a counterbalance from Pakistan, then first strike instability will ensue. However, if Pakistan matched the first strike capability, then by both states possessing first strike capabilities against each other, first strike instability can be transformed into first strike stability, whereby neither will have the temptation of conducting preemptive strikes. Now, Pakistan's nuclear forces therefore need to take the incentive away from India that it can conduct a nuclear first strike, whether it remains limited or not against Pakistan during a crisis in order to avoid waiting and then absorbing Pakistan's first strike. And the only way it can neutralize any Indian advantage of striking Pakistan first in a preemptive nuclear first strike is by Pakistan balancing it with its own preemptive first strike options, both counter force and counter value. Now, these costs in the shape of counter value and counter force strikes on enemy assets and forces must be communicated to India explicitly. Pakistan must not think that India is contemplating changing NFU to first use. It must strategize based on the knowledge that India has already done so, irrespective of whether official announcements are made or not. In order to have first strike stability, Pakistan must have survivable nuclear forces, and that should be the single most critical strategic aim to be met to ensure the credibility of its deterrence. Now, first strike stability, therefore, would include a twin calculus whereby both Pakistan and India understand that the costs of waiting and incurring first strike from the enemy will be much higher than the cost of striking first. When both sides have an equal incentive to strike first and their strategic force postures 
uh, they, they show this resolving capability, then first strike stability will lead to strengthening of their mutual deterrence. And lastly, in order for the overall strategic stability to prevail in South Asia, both India and Pakistan must ensure that the two essential components of strategic stability, which to my mind are crisis and deterrence stability, remain robust for all times to come. This in turn will not happen until unless both India and Pakistan maintain a mix of offensive and defensive of strategic systems, and for that to happen, their nuclear doctrines would need to be first used with absolute zero ambiguities embedded in their communication to each other for what it entails. It does not matter whether their official doctrines are changed to reflect this shift. India can continue to hedge behind NFU and Pakistan behind NNFU, but as long as both adversaries know that first strike stability exists and is operational, space for crisis instability and deterrence instability to ensue will be minimal. Thank you. I'd like to stop here and look forward to Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Rabi Abdur. Before uh, we take questions from the audience, uh, I, I would like to uh, direct uh, my question towards uh, Dr. Tanvi Kulkarni. Uh, at least we have seen two of our panelists, uh, they have a shared consensus that India's deterrence uh, debt, strategy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China and Pakistan is different. So my question is uh, whether you agree with the idea that India has a decoupled uh, strategy, uh, number one. And uh, secondly, now this question is directed towards the panelists who agree to this idea. Uh, so Itala, can you repeat? repeat what you said. Just okay, so uh, my question is whether you agree with this notion that uh, India has a decoupled deterrence strategy vis-a-vis -vis China and Pakistan. So there are two different uh, uh, two uh, different uh, strategies being used by India to deal with China and Pakistan. Uh, that is my question number one, and this is directed towards you, Dr. Tanvi Kulkarni. And th this, the second question is, and this is directed towards uh, other panelists who agree to this notion that yes, India has two different patterns of strategy for both China and Pakistan. How do you think that it would contribute to the South Asian regional peace paradigm? And do you think that it is tenable in the long run? So should I go ahead? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. So um, now, unlike Pakistan's um, um, nuclear weapons program or doctrine, um, like I said, that um, it, neither the Indian nuclear doctrine or uh, India's nuclear weapons program or Indian nuclear strategy makes um, identifies um, its um, specific nuclear universities. Of course, we can talk about what has prompted India's nuclear weapons program and who are the main concerns for uh, for India. But um, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that, you know, there are different doctrines or there are um, separate, uh, um, how, how do you say, there are separate policies that are um, specifically made for India and Pakistan. Having said that, um, of course, India acknowledges that um, these are uh, two nuclear neighbors uh, with uh, which um, there are confrontations and frequent crises. Um, they have, of course, nuclear capabilities and different nuclear capabilities. So for any nuclear country to have a broad brushstroke nuclear strategy for, uh, for, for nuclear adversaries with different capabilities would in my opinion, the um, disadvantages. Um, and like Frank mentioned that uh, definitely there is a different way of um, nuclear behavior or crisis behavior. I, I actually would like to use the word crisis behavior when it comes to Pakistan and a different crisis behavior when it comes uh, to China as we've seen in the case of 2019 and 2020. Uh, thank you. Please, uh, Dr. Adil, uh, Dr. Rabia, Frank, would you like to pitch in? Uh, yes. Yeah, I'd like to just follow on with what uh, with what Tanvi uh, said just there. And I, I agree with much of it, and especially her formulation that um, I didn't go so far as to say there's two distinct nuclear strategies, but I think Tanvi actually put it better in that during crises, India thinks about nuclear weapons and its national defense differently. Um, 
toward Pakistan and toward China. I think that's a more precise way what I was trying to convey that uh, Tanvi perhaps communicated a little bit better. And um, part of what part of what we're seeing here, and I can see from one of the questions in the chat too, is that India has to face two very different nuclear adversaries and develop ultimately one posture, one nuclear force at the same time. So one of the questions is, you know, why is India developing the Agni-6? Why is India developing um, ICBMs uh, when it has Pakistan as a nuclear adversary and, you know, it, it can easily cover all of Pakistan uh, with missiles with a far shorter range than ICBMs. And the short answer to that is that um, India, I think the primary reason is that India wants to be able to target the east coast of China, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, from launching um, roughly anywhere within India's vast interior. Uh, my own research in a paper I published at the Balfour Center last year uh, drew a strong likelihood, drew us, I think, a fairly strong assessment that there are Agni 3s based in Assam, which allow India from that location with that missile range to already reach Beijing and Shanghai. But because there is, as I say, because there is a single nuclear force, these questions are still going to, um, still going to emerge. And I think what might help clarify that from the Indian side is if there would be simply one set of nuclear crisis behaviors toward both states, when what we see is an increasing divergence there. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Abdul Sultan or Dr. Rabi Akhtar, perhaps you may want to uh, add to it. Yeah, if Dr. Abhya wants to go first, go ahead, please. Go ahead, go ahead, Adam. That's okay, fine. okay. So this uh, decoupling debate, India has a military posture that is poised towards Pakistan only. If we talk about conventional and nuclear for now, I'm talking about what happens in the future, we don't know. But what the problem over here is, once we talk about decoupling, is that the perception that India is transforming its conventional and nuclear to uh, counter a Chinese threat, that's a perception. That is not a reality. And India and China, they have strong trade links and both are uh, bigger powers and they know that going to a conflict is not in their interest. And we saw that in Ladakh, the way India managed the Ladakh crisis and the way India managed Pulwama crisis. So the behavior and the force posturing that, and the way Prime Minister Modi threatened Pakistan, it cannot afford to antagonize or threaten China in that way. So my uh, considered conclusion is that India and China are never going to go to a war with each other, uh, never. I'm talking about at least for a decade or so. What happens thereafter, we don't know. Probably there could be another COVID, so we don't we can't predict that far. But uh, that is a problematic thing uh, because, uh, like um, uh, ICBM's question again, that also and what Tanvi also suggested that India is more uh, trying to integrate its conventional capabilities because it has options to deal with Pakistan. So that also, in a way strengthen that hypothesis that India's nuclear capability is more to do with prestige to demonstrate that it is a major power. And the ICBM question that why I said so, Frank, uh, Agni-3 is okay, but India is also pursuing 8,000 to 12,000 ICBMs which, which go beyond China. So where, where it is targeted to, of course, not the United States or European continent, but it's kind of a prestige thing that since all the major powers have ICBMs, so India must build its ICBM. So if you look overall development of India's and their uh, force posturing and their uh, evolving thinking, uh, the military thinking, defense posture that we say, uh, it is mainly towards Pakistan, Towards China, it wants the world to believe, and that's projected or perceived, uh, but India and China are not going to go to war with each other, and that's my conclusion, but others may disagree. Um, to this effect, and to one of the you know, questions that have been posted uh, here by Mariam uh, Rashid as well, 
um, about India's uh, posturing towards China and Pakistan, you know, I, I, I would urge everybody to read Toby Dalton's and uh, Tong Zhao's uh, Carnegie essay on how China looks at India. And, and this nuclear diet, uh, you know, there is not much stress that this diet has because China, uh, you know, treats India not as a nuclear weapon state. So the deterrence equation uh, that India and China have are completely different from the deterrent equation and requirements that India and Pakistan have. Uh, so, so you just need to look at how India is modernizing, what kind of posturing it is going to do in, in years to come. And with raising the specter of two front th threat uh, to know that its deterrence requirements have to be different for how it deals with Pakistan and how it deals with China. I leave it at that. Thank you. Since uh, Dr. Adil Sudan has already commented on this uh, question uh, about Agni Six and uh, and uh, knowing that uh, it, it's its range extends from six thousand kilometers to around ten thousand kilometers and uh, as a, having a worldwide reach, this question was. Uh, initially directed towards Dr. Tanvi. So Dr. Tanvi, uh, this uh, Sajad Ahmed has written and he has linked the development of um, Agni-6 with the prestige factor. What's your comment on that? Um, so, I mean, two things. Um, first, I think Frank gave a, um, a quite a reasonable explanation for the Agni-6. What I did want to add to Frank's um, um, uh, answer to that question was also that um, you know, with missile ranges, um, you can't look at missile ranges just uh, in vacuum because missile ranges then, you know, get coupled uh, with, um, with the yield of nuclear weapons. And, you know, by increasing the yield of nuclear weapons, you shorten the ranges of the nuclear weapons. So, plus, um, just to point out, uh, you know, Agni-6 is um, bound to have MERVs. Um, and you can sort of link it with the MOV developments that are happening in, um, in, in the region. So um, you can put two and two together to also understand why Agni-6. Um, but I wanted to also, Tatha, if I may uh, come back to your decoupling question and just say that, you know, the problem with words like decoupling is that you have to assume then that now if it is decoupled, it was coupled at the beginning, okay? And if it was coupled at the beginning, then, you know, India wouldn't really be thinking about, you know, how to deal with this two front confrontation that it now increasingly sees um, since um, in the last few years. So um, I'd be careful in using words like decoupling because there would be a lot of assumptions then set into it about what was there before. Thanks. So uh, we have the uh, next question from um, Asma Khalid, uh, research associate at uh, CSCR. Uh, she has talked about as, uh, as chances of miscalculation were high during uh, 2019 India-Pakistan crisis. So how did the misperception and miscalculation about each other's capabilities impact strategic stability during the crisis? And because we have Dr. Tanvi from the Indian side, Dr. Frank with an American perspective, Dr. Adil Sultan and Dr. Rabia says, I would like all of you to have a go at this question. Starting from, anyone can take the lead, perhaps Dr. Tanvi can take the lead. Um, Tala, I'm not being able to find the question that you have posed in the chat box. Do you see it again? I mean, I, uh, someone else can start and let me just take a look at the question. Sure. Perhaps, Dr. Frank, you can uh, take the lead. Uh, sure. Um, I just post. I just reposted the question in the bottom of the chat box, Tanvi, if you can see it now. So, I kind of alluded to this in my remarks, but um, one thing just to start with is that it, fe it, it feels like a long time ago now, but um, in other ways, it feels like yesterday that um, we are all living through this crisis. And just the if, just to go back to the feeling of how quickly things moved, where um, where I was based in the U.S. because of the time difference, I would wake up each morning for about a week, and there would be a huge new development in the crisis, um, and kind of record breaking in terms of what had been done before in India-Pakistan relations. 
and just how quickly things moved um, during the crisis. That's something that I think is easy to forget when we look at this with the benefit of hindsight. So the fact that it was so fast moving and in a way so unpredictable in the way that it evolved is one thing that I think undermines strategic stability in the crisis. I mentioned the, um, I mentioned in the state shooting Prithvi's in Rajasthan and threatening their use against Pakistan, um, as well as that in response to that, at the time Pakistan ordered a blackout of military facilities and personnel accommodation within cities, including Lahore, Islamabad and Karachi. And this is because Pakistan, looking at what India was doing, drew the assessment that um, if India was going to launch these Prithi missiles, they'd be launched against military targets within major population centers in Pakistan, as opposed to perhaps more geographically isolated defense installations that have had less risk of harming civilians. Um, this in itself is, would be very escalatory if this took place. And this, uh, this led to that Pakistani decision to, uh, to kind of lock down and black out its, uh, its military bases in those cities. So this, this I feel demonstrates the level of, of concern in, in both India and Pakistan side, um, not just about where the crisis might go, but just their own confidence and uh, escalation control that both are taking these very drastic steps that were there. And the point I tried to conclude on um, in, my initial, in my, my initial remarks was that because both sides, I feel, think that they won something and that they proved a point at the end of this crisis, uh, Pakistan showed that it can, you know, essentially trade blows with India and walk away. Uh, India showed that it could get its, uh, get its pilot back, but also that, that it could launch conventional strikes under the nuclear umbrella and manage escalation. My concern is that they'll both try this the next time with the next crisis. And uh, lastly, just while I'm here, I can see that uh, Zafar Khan is uh, interested in getting a, a comment from us on India's anti-ballistic missile systems. Um, and whether or not that affects how that affects deterrence in the region, I think um, I will. I'm one. I will not be in a minority of people who study nuclear issues who are not a fan of anti-ballistic missile systems. Many of us, uh, myself included, the thing that they are inherently destabilizing, and I would contest that they are robust in India's side. Um, what I think they are doing is that um, they are. They might be incentivizing Pakistan to expand its nuclear force, to place greater emphasis on cruise missiles that can more effectively evade them. And for India, it's simply a lot of money toward a system that is not guaranteed to work while still helping generate this Pakistani behavior. Um, so, so I'll leave my remarks there at that. Uh, can I quickly make a comment before, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to hear what Adil has to say about it. Uh, so Frank made a mention of Prithvi. Uh, I would, uh, you know, to question to Asma, from Asma, I would make a mention of Arihant, right? So now we have uh, information that uh, even though Arihant was deployed at the height of the crisis uh, to uh, do nuclear signaling, it was not nuclear armed. Can you believe that at the height of the crisis, you know, when such signaling is done, the adversary would have to believe that the signaling is credible. But later on when the crisis, you know, dissipates and you find out such information that the signaling was not credible, but, was, but you were made to believe that the signaling was credible at the time of the crisis, what does it do to your own credibility? So, so this kind of misperception, uh, which is deliberately generated and you know, then, then put to place uh, to play with uh, you know, decision-making calculus that's going on during a crisis, is extremely, extremely dangerous. Uh, although you know, anything happening at the, crisis, at the time of the crisis, the, you know, the other party to which the signal is being sent uh, you know, would be taken credible credibly and at the face value. 
but I think it does not do any service uh, to India to dilute its own credibility when, when uh, you know, uh, evidence, uh, you know, comes out uh, contrary uh, at the end of the crisis. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, can I add, uh, Tala? Yeah, okay. So sure. what Rabia said, <laughs> I think uh, it perfectly makes sense why we uh, are more worried about this misperceptions and miscalculations. Uh, because in deterrence or deterrence stability, once we talk about clarity of communication is very important, how you convey the signal so that the other side should uh, uh, receive what is intended by the uh, other party. So in India's case, that has been a problem. This is what I said in my opening remarks also, probably the military leadership and the political leadership, they have not yet been able to identify the real objectives of their deterrence capability because they are, do not face any existential threat and they acquire nuclear capability because all the major powers have nuclear weapons. So India must develop that nuclear weapons. China is not going to attack uh, India. Pakistan is not going to attack India, but still they develop. They have acquired, but they have not been able to operationalize their nuclear weapons in their overall defense strategy. And that is causing major confusions amongst India's strategic enclave. Um, one example that of clarity of communication, India has a doctrine, but there's more confusion on to the, about its doctrine. Pakistan doesn't have a declared doctrine, but there is better clarity because of these statements and because of the deterrence impact a relatively small, a smaller state like Pakistan has generated out of its limited nuclear capability. That speaks about why clarity of communication is directly proportional to the efficacy of deterrence uh, relationship. One question that about uh, impact of ABM system, Frank has already said, but from our perspective, what we think is that having that ABM system robust or not robust, it can get, give that false sense of security to the Indian decision makers that they can launch a preemptive strike against Pakistan. And if there is, there are any remaining and Pakistan responds to that, our ABM system would be able to intercept those. By having this S-400s and their own indigenous ABM system, probably that resolve or that uh, thinking in India's decision maker, maybe probably in the future crisis, you never know Prime Minister Modi or his successor can have that false sense of security. Let's launch a counterpoise strike against Pakistan because our ABM systems are robust. But we all know the, these ABM systems are not foolproof. And between India and Pakistan, where the flight time is only four to five minutes, it can lead to only illusions. It cannot give foolproof security. And once we are talking about nuclear deterrence, even few are enough to cause unacceptable damage. But we are, what we are thinking or talking about is the rationality. Finally, one point that uh, Rabia also talked about, first strike stability. Yes, uh, it is good once the leaders or the decision makers are rational. But if they are irrational, the way 2019 Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Modi behaved, this first strike stability could lead to instability. But that's uh, my take. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Tala, can I? Uh, okay, please, uh, uh, Dr. Tani, you can add. Then I'll have two more questions before we wrap sure. up the proceedings. Sure. You know, um, what I'd uh, like to do is then uh, take Asma and Sheroz's uh, questions together uh, and sort of club them up. Sheroz is asking about CBMs. Um, so I, I guess uh, all pardon, of us. Pardon, uh, my, pardon my interruption. Uh, let me add into the CBM question because uh, one of our viewers who is watching the proceedings sure. on YouTube. Uh, he's also asked the same question and uh, he has talked about uh, uh, while appreciating the risk, what stops India from engaging in a dialogue or negotiating CBMs and conflict resolution with Pakistan? So you can add it up with Sheru's question and you can answer. Sure, sure, sure. So um, to get back to Asma's question and the rest of the comments that have been made, I think all of us do agree that um, when a crisis erupts, um, uh, in an India-Pakistan scenario, um, there are, are definitely a lot of dangers built into it, dangers of escalation that we saw in uh, 2019. Um, and as I mentioned in uh, my uh, remarks also, that one of the places that 
um, that this nucleotide is really uh, falling behind in is uh, definitely crisis communication and uh, crisis de-escalation measures. Um, you know, um, and because crisis itself takes such a rapid pace between India and Pakistan, uh, from an Indian perspective, then of course, um, you know, uh, you'd appreciate that, um, you know, the morphing of the crisis easily into a nuclear crisis is also a danger that India sees that is built into, say, the, um, the battlefield nuclear weapons of uh, Pakistan. So this, this quick escalation from a conventional crisis to a nuclear crisis is also something uh, that, uh, the, that India is extremely um, uh, worried about when it comes to uh, Pakistan's nuclear posture. Um, having, you know, speaking about crisis itself um, and then, you know, turning to CBMs, um, we definitely need more CBMs on, um, you know, dealing with, with crisis, about what happens when a crisis actually starts. And a lot of the CBMs that we have right now, and by the way, there is a huge inventory of, you may, huge may be an um, overstatement, but there is a substantial inventory of CBMs um, in place between India and Pakistan since the 1990s, since even before the two countries um, became nuclear weapon states. And a lot of those CBMs still hold. Last I know, I don't think any of the country has reneged from any of uh, the CBMs. But it's also important to understand what CBMs do. Uh, for instance, Shiroz asked the question, you know, are there enough to save us from the threat of nuclear weapon, uh, nuclear war? No, that's not what C CBMs are even meant to do. Um, if you have to, you know, go back from, step back from the fear of a nuclear war, you need a lot more substantial um, things to do. CBMs are basically uh, that step that you take for, for the engagement. And what has happened with India and Pakistan is we have, you know, we've not been able to pass the ladder of CBMs. Um, and at least from the Indian, uh, Indian side, since 2008, and, you know, uh, finally when the CBM dialogue broke down in 2012, you know, over the years, also because of the way the public is seeing is, there is definitely reduced appetite for dialogue with Pakistan, leave alone on nuclear issues, um, because of how the subconventional threat and terrorist attacks in India have panned. So it is important to understand that the Indian public is not going to have an appetite, uh, and neither is the political leadership going to have an appetite for, you know, uh, a CBM dialogue until um, these issues are also substantially addressed. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. We have one uh, final question uh, after which, we, okay, so Dr. Adil would like to add. Please, sir. Uh, yeah, my apology. I just wanted to add something on uh, CBMs. <laughs> CBMs are not an end itself. These are means to achieve certain objective. And if there are apprehensions onto the other side, so more CBMs would always be useful. But uh, what India is doing is, it has become more dismissive uh, to engage in Pakistan. The approach that they have taken now is that if they, there is a need for CBM, probably China needs to be roped in, which is again complicating a situation. Why would China get involved in India-Pakistan scenario? But just I'll uh, mention about couple of CPMs that have probably been deteriorated in its true context, like missile notification arrangement that we have both India and Pakistan. So both sides did notify each other before testing a missile, a ballistic missile. So once this was being negotiated, Pakistan suggested that include all the missiles, maybe cruise and ballistic both. India objected at that time because we had not yet tested power cruise missile. So India had those Brahmos, so India said, no, it's only going to be ballistic missiles. And it makes sense because this model, we took it from the Cold War and the rationale behind this was that a ballistic trajectory intercepted or identified by the other side should not be construed as a preemptive strike, hence, uh, we need to notify each other of a, a missile uh, test. So that was the rationale. So what ha has happened now is that this was in tech, but lately India has not been notifying subsurface ballistic missile uh, launched from the submarines or submerged platform. And the rationale that they are taking is that this is not from the land surface. 
they are not taking into account the sole purpose of this uh, ballistic missile notification was to remove any misunderstanding onto the other side that this is not a preemptive strike. So this is how they are now playing with the CBMs also. In 2012, Pakistan also offered four new CBMs. Those were related to nuclear safety and uh, cooperation in nuclear related technologies, agriculture and medicines and things like that. And I remember it was post uh, Fukushima uh, because of that accident. So Pakistan approached India uh, because both countries had some of the candle type reactors. So that we need to share best practices. India outrightly rejected. So we don't want to have. So after that, there is a stronger perception in Pakistan of this CBM's fatigue because it is leading nowhere. So that is one on uh, CBM. But before you uh, take away mic from me, uh, there was an important question by Ms. Nazala about hypersonic weapons and its, its impact on return stability. I think that is important. I just briefly mentioned hypersonic weapons development, but this is important. India and Pakistan already flight time of normal missiles is not more than a couple of minutes. Why to have these hypersonic weapons? Reason again, India wants to be equated since United States, Russia and China, they are building hypersonic. India need to build hypersonic weapons. One. Now having that hypersonic weapons because it reduces the reaction time onto the other side. So there could it could be integrated into India's this counter force temptations or the strategy that they might uh, develop these hypersonic weapons as a deterrence against Pakistan not to bring out or deploy your short range uh, ballistic missiles in the field because we have hypersonic missiles and we can create that shock and all kind of impact. Now, now gel it with the uh, signaling coming from the Indian side of counter force strikes against Pakistan. So the capabilities that are being developed and the doctrinal uh, misconceptions deliberate or uh, uh, deliberately or unwittingly uh, created by the Indian decision makers. Now, from a Pakistani side, you have these statements and you have these capabilities coming up. So what do you see a picture that probably India is going towards counter force uh, strikes? So that is why it is destabilizing, destabilizing between India and Pakistan. Thank you. Okay, uh, so due to, due to the paucity of time, I cannot take uh, I have so I have so many questions in the chat box, but uh, I can only take one. And uh, I think it is a very important one as well. Uh, does the nuclear reality of South Asia need uh, totally nuanced and new nuclear epistemology? And if yes, how can India and Pakistan collectively contribute towards that? Uh, this question is uh, posed by Amraz Ahmed from CSCR and uh, please, feel free to add in, we, we, we are short of time, so uh, uh, be quick uh, about it. Thank you. That's a, that's a very big question, and uh, and it's one that's hard to do with a short answer. Um, I would limit my remarks to talking about and there was a previous question as well about you know what are the what's the possibility for new arms control or new CBMs uh, between Pakistan and India and what could be done next? And I think the uh, the I think the elephant in the room here with regard to both points is China in that um, China is obviously part of India's nuclear planning, uh, while as has been said previously. Uh, China refuses to recognize India as a nuclear weapon state. It refuses to have any uh, military nuclear dialogue with India. It's very happy to talk with India about nuclear reactor safety, non-proliferation, things like that, but it will not talk with India about um, nuclear stability between the, 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 the two states. And it, it's simply hard to extricate China from um, the South Asian nuclear competition. And so I think for things to reasonably move forward, China does have to become involved in these kinds of South Asian um, arms control agreements that exist. Uh, even at the level of, you know, joining the, um, the pre-notification uh, of missile launches agreement between, um, between India and Pakistan. Um, that's kind of, I think, the big thing that we need to see happen before we can see meaningful progress um, on those in that area. But it involves a, a fairly dramatic rethinking from China toward how it sees India. 
And perhaps this might only happen if um, similar to how, you know, China doesn't take the U.S., China doesn't take India seriously. Um, the, China looks at the U.S. As, as being, you know, the main uh, cause, the main influence on its nuclear forces. Perhaps the U.S. needs to get involved, too, um, with regard to perhaps greater involvement in perhaps joining these mechanisms. Um, I've written about this in a, in a Stimson Center um, piece published a couple of years ago now for what was the off-ramp series. Um, but I think that's, that's kind of where things need to go for meaningful progress to be made. Yeah, Talam, can I? Please, please. Yeah, so, I mean, I can almost think of a very philosophical answer to this, but uh, let me not try and uh, make it philosophical and bring it a little more um, to reality. Um, the nuclear landscape of uh, the world is definitely changing. That is something to be um, acknowledged. Uh, it's very different from, um, you know, how it was um, 20 years earlier or even 30 years earlier. And it's very important to, to realize that while we take lessons from uh, the Cold War, um, we, um, nuclear countries now cannot, especially the newer nuclear countries, cannot fall into the traps of replicating nuclear behaviors of, um, of the Cold War. Um, you know, scholarly intervention is absolutely needed in, uh, in new nuclear um, thinking. Quite frankly, problems related to deterrence instability, strategic instability, escalation, command control, brinkmanship, you know, they've been present in the past, they will be present um, today. Um, we need to have a scholarly rethink on what these mean today. Uh, do they mean uh, the automatic consequences of what they meant uh, during the Cold War? Perhaps not. Uh, we're talking about a world where we are talking about, you know, strategic chains, strategic um, linkages, um, triads, truels, if you want to call it. And of course, that does not mean that we can't talk about uh, nuclear diets. Um, and finally, uh, I'd like to say that, you know, um, at the moment, what is absolutely essential is to see how new technologies um, introduce new forms of escalation and command and control problems for um, all nuclear weapon states. Um, and um, and like I said, acknowledge that we have entered into a new nuclear phase and that we need new lenses to look at um, and, and new constructs and formulations to look at the nuclear dangers of today. Thank you. Hello, can I briefly? Yes, please, sir. Uh, you and Dr. Rabia both can have. No. To address this question, we have a complete webinar tomorrow on nuclear learning in South Asia. So I think that's a very important question. And uh, what we have done is we have invited uh, fresh or uh, the emerging scholars to give a fresh perspective because we keep saying what we have said today. And this question is very important. So tune into tomorrow's webinar. So I took this opportunity to run a promo of my webinar for tomorrow run by Air University and Straff Asia. Thank you. For all good reasons, for all good reasons. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Tala. Uh, so Adil and I were part of a King's College discussion on uh, the, you know, what it means uh, for Indian and Pakistanis when they look at uh, titles like, you know, concepts like deterrence and all. Uh, I think we don't need to, you know, reinvent the wheel and go back and, and have a South Asian deterrence, uh, you know, definition. But it is extremely important that we have zero ambiguities in as to what it means for both countries. You know, when India says NFU, it needs to mean NFU. It does not need to oscillate between a maybe FU and, a, you know, not so NFU. Uh, secondly, you know, credible minimum deterrence needs to mean credible minimum deterrence. And if it is not minimum, if it is minimum towards uh, Pakistan, but maximum towards China, then probably minimum needs to be dropped from that, uh, you know, doctrine. And so massive retaliation, a mass uh, yeah, massive retaliation, you know, assured retaliation. What does it mean when these words are used? So I think both India and Pakistan need to know exactly what it means, because when it will be put to use, and God forbid when it will be put to use, um, you know, uh, strategies are made based on actual, you know, uh, you know, definitions, and both are absolutely clear on what that means. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, my uh, 
gratitude towards the speakers who have taken out time from their busy schedule to join us today. And I'm, I'm especially grateful to our foreign guest speakers, uh, Dr. Tanvi Kulkarni and uh, Dr. Frank O'Donnell. Uh, I'm also grateful to the participants who have logged in to watch the live webinar proceedings through the Zoom software and our YouTube page. Uh, we initially developed a glitch, a glitch in the original YouTube link that was shared on the social media, but uh, I got the new link up and running through, uh, during Dr. Adil Sultan's talk. So the webinar can be viewed in entirety. Uh, just some initial bit is redacted. Uh, I'll try to upload the full video and get the issue resolved post event. Uh, I am sure this conversation would generate a lot of buzz, but the clap trap aside, there is a serious need to engage with each other in good faith. Uh, we conclude the talk now. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.